action items, discuss discussion and action to adopt the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2015 to 2016. Thank you, Board. We appreciate you being here tonight for this special meeting so that we can kind of dive into the details of this uh, preliminary budget. Uh, in front of you, you have three, three documents, um, one of which is a copy of the PowerPoint presentation so you don't hurt your necks turning around looking at the screen. Uh, <clears throat> the second of which is the preliminary budget document that went out with the agenda last week that we've been working on. And the third is a comparable document that uh, President McKay asked me to put together so that we can see trend data from fiscal years 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15 actual date, and then compare that to the 15, 16 budget, just so you can kind of see uh, where we get the numbers, where they come from. The actual data in the third document is actual data from 12, 13, 13, 14. The 14, 15 data is through today, so it is a little less than but it will be at the end of the year, but it gives us a pretty good idea of where we stand comparatively. Yeah, we've got two more weeks. And then the, the final column in that document is the 15-16 um, preliminary budget. I'd like to start um, this presentation by um, reminding everybody that this is a preliminary budget. It must be adopted by June 30th in order for us to continue uh, our operations. Final budgets are not due until the end of August or early September. Between then and now, we will have time to look at the economic conditions, the legislative conditions uh, that have changed, the political conditions, the financial conditions, uh, all of the things that we know are kind of on the cusp of operations and will be dealt with in that process. The second thing that I will ask is that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. If there is a clarification issue in terms of a, a word that I use that you don't understand or you need clarification on what I mean, please stop me and ask, but if it's a specific question regarding the budget, a lot of those questions will be answered within the presentation. Uh, and that goes uh, for the audience as well. We'd like to entertain questions from the audience as well uh, at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to begin with the budget timeline process, opportunities and challenges. Um, management begins work on this budget in early April. The first draft of the personnel budget is due to finance uh, in early April, it's due on the 10th of this year. Then on the 14th, management met to go over what we call cost centers. These are all the job locations within the district that we do work on. We went through and determined what jobs were going to be worked on this year, who was going to be there, how many hours were going to be spent on those cost centers at those locations, uh, how much materials were going to be spent by vendor. We looked at it from prior years and compared how much we're going to need in the next fiscal year, what we're anticipating. Uh, these, are, these were long uh, meetings with everybody that we sat down in the board conference room here and, and really went after it. <coughs> Uh, on the 17th, the second draft of the personnel budget was due. Uh, this is where we got a chance to look at positions that we were going to need to fill or not fill. Um, what the retirement costs were going to be based on the information that we had at the time from CalPERS. Uh, we then met again on the 21st and went through all the GL items, the, the actual costs of things. Once we rolled up the cost centers to determine how much we were going to spend on each project, we had to determine of those projects, what was going to be a utility, what was going to be labor, what was going to be materials, so on and so forth. The following week, we had a third meeting, and we rolled all of that information up into the fund level. How much of those particular expenses were going to be spent from the water fund, the sewer fund, so on and so forth. 15th of May, the final personnel budget was due. We had made a decision about whether or not we were going to pay off the PERS liability or not at that time. What we did then is it saved us a significant retirement costs in this budget because we paid off the 30-year liability that we talked about last week. On the 27th, uh, or excuse me, the 26th, we had an open board workshop here in this room. Uh, several members of the public and, and staff were involved in that meeting uh, where we went over the budget at that time, uh, opened up questions, I gave a brief presentation, and we, we kind of tackled the hard issues about where we were going to go in terms of the budget deficit. Uh, the following day, we had one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, in 
my office where two of the directors came in and spoke with me in detail about what we had talked about the day before. We're given the opportunity to really dialogue about uh, the condition, the financial condition of the district. It was a very productive meeting. Uh, between then and now, um, all the final adjustments were made. Um, and then uh, tonight, we, we sit before approval. Some of the opportunities and challenges that we, um, that we came across in this process Start with the opportunities. Last year, we decided to move our money from the local agency investment fund to CalTrust. The local agency investment fund is a big pool of, of investments for municipalities throughout the state that pool their money. And eight years ago, when I started auditing municipalities, LAFE was paying 4.5%. It's 450 basis points in financial terms. Today, they're paying 25. That's a quarter of 1%. We weren't earning any money. So we re-employed our finances, our investment portfolio with Wells Fargo, a subsidiary of Wells Fargo called CalTrust, and they're paying us between 50 and 75 basis points on our earnings. So we went from about ten dollars to $12,000 of investment earnings to closer to $50,000 of in investment earnings, which is a really good shift and use of our money. Uh, the retirement costs, we've talked a lot about it. Gatsby 68 came out this year, and we decided to pay off our liability. By doing that, we've reduced our percent of retirement costs of payroll from just over 15% to just over 9%, saving ourselves about 6% of total payroll costs in the future fiscal years. We've, uh, we've had a lot of success with GEI helping us with our grants for the arsenic, and uh, we've had some grant revenue offsets in the last years, upwards of a uh, million bucks. We have that again this year. It's a little less. We have about $630,000 left in the grant that we originally applied for that we're going to be getting in this, in this coming year. Uh, the adjudication, we paid off. Uh, we will be paying off the Woods class adjudication case this year. Um, but there is some talk of a, of a Willis case coming in next year. The upside is that it's going to be less than the, the Woods case was. So we're saving ourselves some money there. Uh, as Director Landsgard mentioned last meeting, last week, we paid off the mortgage on this building. Our long-term debt costs are going down. We're not taking out any new debt as of yet. Um, so our interest payments are, are becoming less and our principal payments are becoming more of the total uh, cash outflows, which is good. Uh, the personnel costs have been managed very successfully, as you'll see in the comparative document in front of you. Uh, you can see personnel costs fluctuating, but for the most part, they're very consistent in this time, in this economic time, we see a lot of rising payroll costs and the district has done a very good job in managing those costs. Some of the challenges, as you all know, we have the state mandate for water conservation. We have to reduce our water use by 28%. It's going to be tricky in terms of revenues. Salary allocations um, was a big challenge this year. We have decreased revenues in the water fund and increased salary expenses in the water fund because we've had to reallocate the salaries from the park function to between the water and sewer function this year. Um, while it's been a challenge, we have overcome it in this preliminary budget. The Another challenge we had is the pool closure this year. We're going to lose some of those revenues uh, in terms of service fees and user fees of the people coming to the pool and renting it and taking swim lessons. That's just the financial challenge, let alone the community uh, demeanor challenge. Roseman's a, an older CSD. Uh, we have aging assets, and until last year, we had not taken any financial measures to deal with that aging infrastructure. I'm happy to report that we've been able to save up some money this year and, and can begin to think about doing some bigger projects and getting after the deferred maintenance of our aging assets. But our infrastructure's old. As we heard um, John Houghton talk about several times, there's been a lot of leaks that his guys have been working on, and we need to get after that in terms of being proactive. Uh, we also have aging buildings, aging computer systems. Um, we have new laws that we need to comply with in terms of uh, computer security, uh, and, and that's all going to be part of this budget. Street lighting has been a challenge, as we all know. And then the last one, the last challenge is we did have lower than expected development in the last fiscal year. We've, we've kind of taken that into, into consideration for this budget year to make sure that we're not overzealous about the anticipated um, development in the community. Um, 
we'd rather be surprised, we'd rather under budget and be over surprised with the revenues versus being uh, ambitious with our revenue projections and then being disappointed. <coughs> so as a whole, the fiscal year 2015-16 shows an operating deficit of about $700,000. As you can see, the operating revenues are coming in a little lower than last year. Discretionary revenue has been flat, and the restricted revenues are up because of the grant revenue over the, over the total years. If you look at the paired document, it went from $18,000 to about $718,000 here in this year. Last year, we had a little bit more because we were uh, privy to more of the grant money for the arsenic work that GEI was helping us with. Administrative expenses have gone up for several reasons, which we'll get into, and depreciation has increased steadily, which is normal. Next slide. So what I did is I went through and I just did some basic analysis on the major changes in the revenue base. I looked at the 14-15 budget and I looked at the 15-16 budget, which you'll see there are two columns. You have the financial variance and the percentage variance. So the user fees are all park fees, the pool fees that we're not going to get at all this year. Uh, we're anticipating our late charges and bank charges to go up significantly in terms of our revenue because when you put more money onto a utility bill, it makes it harder for that person to pay the bill. So by bringing the sewer fee back onto the bill, by raising the lighting costs on the utility bill, historically, we've seen more late fees, we've seen more shutoffs, we've seen more people not paying their bill on time and thereby increasing our late charge revenue side. The new service installation, we've um, budgeted at zero this year. Again, that's a conservative approach. If we get some, that's great. If not, we haven't budgeted for it. Uh, the administration and reconnection has gone up by about $15,000 because of what I just described in terms of larger bills. Our interest income, I've explained, uh, our miscellaneous income is just that, it's miscellaneous. We have multiple different line items that can kind of fall into that area, whether it's bringing on um, money from our legacy deposit or uh, sewer dumpers, whatever it is. We try not to get over ambitious, but when I looked at the actual data that was coming through, a $7,000 number was too low. So we put in 34,000 for this year because that's kind of been more in line with what's actually happened over the last couple of fiscal years. Property tax and assessments has gone up significantly because of the lighting vote. We group our revenues in here for LLAD number two in this line item, so you're going to see a result of an increased revenue in that line item. Uh, designated revenue has gone down just a bit, 14% uh, looks like a big number, but as a percentage it's not that big. Uh, again, we're being conservative uh, with different types of uh, designated revenues there. Um, property tax and assessments, the next one down, um, that's the discretionary revenue um, that we get. It's a 1% out of the Laram tax from the county. Uh, again, it's been pretty flat. System connection fees, uh, again, that's the lower development costs. We budgeted $170,000 last year, budgeting $40,000 this year. Conservation fees have gone down. Um, again, we're just not getting them. And then the grants went from 983000 to 614000 That's the, That's what we're eligible for at the GDI uh, and the Arsenal. I wanted you to get a kind of a sense of where all of that data came from. So um, the, the fiscal year 12, 13, 14, and then the budget year, as I described, the 14, 15 is going to be a little bit lower, but we, have, we haven't finished the year yet. Uh, but you can see the trend in the discretionary revenues has kind of remained flat as property values have increased. And then the restricted revenues, that's our restricted income, our interest income, the grant income is the big one in there that has to be used for specific things, so it is a restricted uh, revenue. The rest of the operating revenues, uh, mind you, they're in tens. Uh, for comparison purposes, I had to divide it down so that the graphs weren't skewed. Uh, but you can kind of get a sense that, for the most part, things are relatively stable over four fiscal years. Did the same thing with expenses. I'm not going to go through each line item here. If you have specific questions at the end of the presentation, we'd be happy to answer them. But these are the major changes in the expense line items uh, 
over the two budget years. The big one you'll notice up there at the top, the first contribution is because we decided to pay off the, the liability. So we've gone from 15% to 9%. It's going to be a big chunk of change for us in terms of the percentage uh, in costs. Uh, it was a really good decision of the board to do that, in my opinion. Uh, the rest of them, uh, pretty flat. Anything else in there I want to touch on? Um, no. Did the same thing with expense trends, personnel expenses, direct operating expenses, GNA expenses, and depreciation. Um, they're all in, in multiples of 10. So they're, they're million dollar figures, not $100,000 figures. Uh, and as you can see, personnel expenses have been relatively flat um, and have been actually a savings. We did pretty well. We went from 208 to 203. We haven't finished the 15 years, so that's relatively in line to be right where we expect it to be. Uh, direct operating costs, we saw a trend downward for about three years, and now we're trending a little bit back upwards. It's all fine. Uh, the GNA expenses are the big one. Those are actually running the operations. Those are um, postage and mailers, we've had a lot of additional things that we have to mail out because of our compliance issues or our newsletters. Um, we have increased uh, legal fees in there as well. Uh, and then the depreciation, which uh, with an aging infrastructure asset base, that's going to be pretty normal. <clears throat> the next slide you'll see is then a detail. water fund and these are all of the charges so the water fund this is the water fund in its entirety uh, at a very high level is going to lose just over a million dollars this year now I'll remind the board that this is these are operating losses we still have capital projects we still have transfers we still have adjustments and we still have uh, the other items below the line what we call below the line uh, that balance this fund but it's important that you see these numbers because it reflects the cost of doing business. So when you look through this, we're earning these monies and we're spending these monies as they relate to this water function. And it's imperative that we understand that operations are supposed to pay for operations in a proprietary fund. And we're supposed to be making enough money to pay the bills. That number at the bottom should be zero. So we need to, in the next fiscal years, several fiscal years, figure out what we're going to do about that. In the meantime, we've been able to balance it with, with other accounting mechanisms. Uh, but it won't last forever. Same thing I did for the sewer fund. I've done this for all the funds. Um, you get a sense here, the sewer fund is actually making money. Not very much, but it is making money, and it's because it has a lower depreciable base. Uh, depreciation in the water fund is 1.4, depreciation in the sewer fund is 600,000, which is going to make up the majority of the difference. Um, but again, we, the rate study that we're thinking about doing is going to be pivotal to the success of these proprietary funds in the future. Street lighting fund, this is fund three. This is originally set up to capture the costs and revenues for the arterial lighting. This is the $1. Um, this fund's losing money, but it's not losing money the way it used to, and that's good. Uh, we've stopped the bleeding uh, in the last fiscal year. We've done a pretty good job of managing those costs. The election that we're going to be going out to do this year to, to cover those costs will give us a pretty good sense of what we need to be doing. But again, it's imperative that the board is aware that this fund is losing money. There are no salaries in here. There are almost no administrative costs in here. Um, by paying, by amortizing the $25,000 that the board borrowed to pay the lighting bills, over a longer period of time, we've saved a significant amount of money in debt service. That number that should have been $25,000, but because we approved the loan last week for the three million, I was able to amortize that debt service over a longer period, saving that fund some money in the current fiscal year. LL82 is the assessment district for the lighting established in 2006. This fund's making money, and interestingly enough, it's making the exact amount of money that the other fund is losing. So 
the assumption is that the funds are being diverted through LL82 and that the total cost of lighting are being captured, but they're not being captured in the right places. And until we do the analysis and we go out to the boat and we work with our consultants on these lighting issues, this will be the case. Again, this is a preliminary budget, and we're going to be going out to do that vote here sooner than later, probably before the final budget is due, and we'll have a much better sense of what these funds are actually doing in terms of costs and revenues at that time. The Park Fund. Um, we've stopped the bleeding here, and we've balanced it to the place where it can afford to pay back its portion of the debt service which was the ultimate goal of the $3 million loan that we approved last week. This, this fund has been running in a deficit for years. It never had a revenue source outside of the discretionary revenues that the board approved for, for it. it. It generates no money whatsoever in terms of what it's doing. And I'd like to take an opportunity here just to mention that a lot of my other clients are cities. cities are general fund cities. They get property taxes that they can use at their discretion. And the purpose of having a general fund is to subsidize functions for the benefit of the community. So the library is a really good example. A lot of cities have libraries. They're community centers um, that are for the benefit of the community. But it costs 25 cents a week to rent a book. And it's not ever going to pay for a director's salary of $120,000. And everybody knows that. The purpose is for the general fund to subsidize that for the benefit of the community. Community services districts are not cities. We don't have general funds. We don't have any money with which to subsidize our activities for the community. And as much as we'd like to, we can't. So it's imperative that this board take a position of revenue generation for the services that we want to provide. And we can do that in one of many ways through strategic planning. But we can't keep spending money against a non-revenue source. And this budget addresses that problem from a reduction in expenditures, not in revenues. So we've developed a budget that creates a surplus of about $62,000, which, as you'll see later in the presentation, is going to be used to subsidize salaries. <coughs> Park maintenance fund, same thing. This is our, these are our CSAs that we talked about, county service areas. As you see, I broke out three different CSAs that we get, 63.45 and 6. <coughs> we just get a designated amount of revenues. Um, I've noticed trend-wise that we get a little bit more than the county projects, but these are the numbers we have to use um, for budget purposes. Gets a little bit of interest income. Um, we tried to... to uh, minimize the expenses in this fund this year, and it has generated a surplus of about $9,500, again, which will be used to subsidize salaries. So let's talk about debt. At this time, we have five components of debt. We have the interfund loan that we approved last week. We have a Woods Class adjudication note. We have the Zion's note payable, the state revolving fund loan, and the water bank JPA. The top portion of the left graph shows what's due in this fiscal year. So the numbers you see in this year's budget are comprised of those five pieces. The portion below is total, including what's above. So that's what we owe in total for interest and debt over the next 25 years. Here. Uh, the question, what is the interphone? Interfund 2015-10 loan for how much principal and interest are due this year, how much is due total, and when does it mature? Uh, the interfund loan, as you all know, was recently approved by the board to refinance and consolidate all the other interfund loans that the, the prior boards had put in place. Uh, we had a negative cash balance last year that needed to be paid off, and we also had the retirement liability due to CalPERS. Of it, 152 is principal, 7,400 is interest, which is due this year. Total principal is just under $3 million. Total interest is $76,000. All but one of these loans matures in fiscal year 2035. The one matures in 2030. Uh, and that's just because of the amount that's due from that particular fund. 
they don't owe as much, and it's not going to take them as long to pay it off. What is the Zion's note payable for? How much principal and interest are due this year total, and when does it mature? The Zion's note was taken out in December of 2008 in order to complete the construction of various district projects. It's split between the water and sewer fund 8.7 and 11.3, respectively. 123.5 principal and 115 of interest are due in 2015-16, and the total principal is 2.3 million, the total interest of 910,000. The loan matures in 2028. The next two questions came in uh, from the public, and they were emailed in, and we were happy to, to get those questions. <clears throat> How much of the water principal and interest expense goes exclusively to the water bank? I'll take a moment to tangent from the question and give a background on what the water bank is, for those who don't know, from a finance perspective. We don't need to get into the operations of it. The water bank, from a finance perspective, is an investment. We're investing in it like you would Apple or Google or anything on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We give them, we've, we've uh, participated uh, through intellectual property. Our original investment was a 3% buy-in for intellectual property. That has been increased to 6%. And the cost of those shares was $6 million. They have agreed to allow us to make payments of that buy-in to buy our 6% in increments of $500,000 a year. We make two $250,000 payments per year. It's not a debt. We're investing. It's going from cash right back onto the balance sheet as an investment in JPA, Joint Powers Authority, of which we are a 6% shareholder. There is no interest on that loan. It's not a loan. The second question, why are there no sales revenue from storage space at the water bank? Well. There's no water to store for the first, in the first place. We don't have any. We're in a drought. Additionally, we're a 6% shareholder in the water bank. The excess capacity isn't ours to sell. So what that means is that if the water bank were to, as an authority, sell storage space, we would get a 6% of that income, like you would a dividend if you owned a stock in Apple or Google or any other stock. That's the way that works. And we get a couple of thousand bucks a year of their income. They have normal revenues, normal expenses, and the difference is distributed to the shareholders on a share basis, on a per share basis. So we don't necessarily own anything of the water bank in terms of its actual capacity. We just own a share in it and its financial operations. The next question we got from the public, how much of the sewer principal and interest expense goes toward the wastewater treatment plant? And the answer is 373,000 of principal and 161 of interest. The state loan that we saw on the previous slide is exclusively for the wastewater treatment plant. And that's how much of it it's costing us. The, uh, the next question from the public, why are there no committed sales or revenue from the wastewater treatment plant? The answer is the treated wastewater must be permitted via the state regulations. We're in the process of getting permitted at this time, but until we are, no sales can be made. Additionally, we have only three letters of intent to buy, the largest being the mine in the county of Kern. Uh, you'll see in the next few slides that we are planning to extend the purple pipe in part of our capital projects in the 15, 16 years, so that we are in the process of, of moving forward with that expansion um, while we're waiting on the permitting process. But at this time, we cannot sell that water by law. Um, as you'll see, we have several water projects place of main lines and service lines, Oak, Elm, Orange, Melvin, Gertrude, Edwards, and Myrtle Streets. Uh, we're completing the new meter replacement project. Uh, tank 4 has to be recoded this year. Uh, it also needs a new booster station. The SCADA system, uh, the server replacement is going to be a hefty uh, capital improvement, but it will enable operators to work remotely uh, from back here in Public Works versus having to be at the plant to work on it. Uh, as we talked about the purple pipe installation, $1.2 million has been allocated to install this purple pipe uh, going from the freeway to 40th Street to tie in the school and the park locations. Uh, this $1.2 million covers materials, labor, and overhead. Um, and it will enable about 10% of the uh, tertiary water that's, that is there uh, now to be used to water the school and the park. Uh, lift station. 
normal maintenance, but because it's capital expenditure, it goes here and not in the operating budget. Um, the sewer uh, wastewater treatment plant needs a new uh, four half ton. This is replacing an existing vehicle out there. The existing truck is a 1997, and it's just worn out. Uh, and the last thing there is the dry well pump seal. It's $15,000. We have to convert those seals in order to maintain the integrity. So the next line item you'll see, which is now below the, what we call below the line, is the use of reserves. Uh, last year, as I said, we began a, a rainy day fund for the infrastructure assets, putting 25% of the depreciation costs away into our investment account to use for this very thing. So we have unrestricted, uh, a total unrestricted uh, reserves in the water fund of 742000 Sign balance is 327,000. We're going to use 326 of it to balance the budget to pay for capital projects. Same thing in the sewer fund. We have unrestricted, assigned, and restricted. Excuse me. We're going to use about $500,000 of that to to balance the budget and to pay for capital projects. Street light reserves are not being used. No other no other use of reserves. So when we do use the reserves, we'll have a remainder. $6.2 million as it stands today in our investment account. Transfers. Transfers are unique to governments. And what they do is instead of distributing costs directly to a fund, there's an assumption that those funds are going to subsidize other activities. Transfers are used in cities quite a bit. They're not as commonly used in CSDs but they're allowable and, in this case, very practical. As we saw earlier in the presentation, the LL82 fund has an excess of $48,000 and the street lighting fund has a deficit of $48,000. We're gonna transfer that money from one fund to the other under the assumption that the LL82 fund is collecting money for costs that are being incurred by the street lighting. The park fund is going to transfer out its excess to the water fund because we're assuming that because we didn't close the park function this year, that the guys are still going to be out there working. They're going to be doing projects on behalf of the park and the park function, but it's almost impossible to go back and detail how many hours, how much time as a percentage of their salary that they're going to spend in that function and bill it directly to that fund. So what we do is build their entire salary between water and sewer funds and then subsidize those salary costs via this transfer. Same thing with the park maintenance fund. Fund 51 is the CSA fund, it's the park maintenance fund, and it doesn't have nearly the amount of personnel costs that the park fund's going to have. So we're transferring those in order to balance the budget in the water fund because that fund is absorbing a majority of the salary costs that would have been allocated to those two funds had we continued the park function. The last line on your budget there is going to be your adjustments. Um, and what we did is we took total depreciation and we decided to transfer 25% of that to our capital project reserve. Um, the rest of it is added back. As, as a basic one, accounting 101 lesson in, in depreciation, depreciation is a non-cash expense. The expense has already been incurred when the asset went through the ground. So if you put $10 million of pipe in the ground 30 years ago, the assumption is that you've been saving 30, one thirtieth of that cost every year so that when, it, when it's fully depreciated, you have the money in the bank to replace it. That hasn't been the case at this particular organization. And we're in the process of fixing that. Um, in an ideal environment, 100% of the depreciation costs would go into a reserve account so that we would have the amount of money in the bank that we needed when, we, when the assets fail, or to do the deferred maintenance in order to keep them from failing and be proactive about it. Um, but in, in order to balance this budget, uh, we've had to add back the amount that we're not transferring into the depreciation fund, uh, and that's what that line item you see on your budget in front of you is doing. First of all, with the it's called the preliminary budget that we're, we're supposed to approve it tonight or sometime before June 30th. The question is after that, after we prefer the preliminary budget, prior to actually uh, voting on the 
main budget uh, it seemed to be last year that we just went from preliminary to approval in August. Uh, are we going to have a couple meetings in between? There's a couple things that are not addressed in the budget. Uh, the stuff that you talked about, policy things, for example, the organizational structure that showed up in the budget last year is not something that we adhere to at this point. And I think Mr. McKay and, and, and President McKay indicated their last workshop uh, strategic planning, he wanted to see that changed overall with the, the customer at the top of the chart and uh, the board at the bottom of the chart. And I guess my question is, is that something that we address now? Is no. This is a preliminary operating budget. I mean, we're gonna this, this, this could have been a three-page document. That's it. That's all you're approving. Okay. And the, rest, the rest of it will come I think in your final budget. budget. You gave us a three-page document. I guess, uh, so if we want to change that policy document before the final budget, are we going to have a kind of rough draft to look at and say, would we like to have that change, or how, how, how do you want that done? We will have several workshops. We can put it put together the final budget. In the whole packet, packet. This is a skeleton. Okay. And I have a few other questions. Um, just kind of going back through that, you said you had a number of jobs that you went through the jobs. Was to, do we have a copy of that job list somewhere? Or? It's about 700 pages. I'll make you a copy if you like one. Sure. 700 pages of a job list. The job list or yeah. the job costs. Because so we went through all of the activity of each one by page. Well, if you want to put that on the disk, I suppose, I would not need the, the paper part, but it would be it's available if you want to come look at it. Sure. Okay, I was thinking more in terms of, you know, is there 10 jobs that we're going to have? Of course, it sounds like very detailed. Is that 700 pages? It's, it's a significant time. Okay. Question. Go ahead. Is, is that a policy issue or is that a management issue that we're talking about all of those, those things? Well, it sounds like he's just interested in what kind of thing we're working on. Well, policy, this is a, uh, my understanding is the budget is a policy document, and it's basically a combination of all, all policy documents. And that's why it's important. Each, yeah. ca each category in the budget is a management function once we approve the overall budget for that department. And you get down into how they're spending all of the money in their budget. That's beyond management. I mean, it's beyond policy to get it right into the management of their fund. I don't know. I don't, I don't think. Let me give you an illustration. I don't think any of us wants to spend Let me give you an illustration. Let me give you an illustration. Okay? There's an office budget. In that office budget, there's a bunch of things. We're approving the office budget for more than $5,000. Now, are we going to care where they buy their paper, where they buy their pens, where they buy their pencils? No. I don't think that's our job. Our job is to give them the budget that they're asking for or lower their budget or raise their budget and let them manage that budget. That's our job. Not to manage that budget for them. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Clinton, I would correct you on one issue, and that is our job is to put policies into effect that use this money in the most frugal way has to, that it can be used. And I'm not saying that we get into management, but I have a lot of questions that I would like to ask. If you have a PERS program, being in business, we could have an employee retirement using IRAs, $2,000 a year. And what I did is I Look at it. If you give me a minute, I've got more paper here and you can say this. Look at it. Well, if you want to look at it, what question I can ask you? Okay, here it is right here, right in front of me. If we, with 21 employees at $2,000 a year, $2,000 per employee per year for retirement, we could save $105,343. I think that's what the public is looking for us to do is to give ideas on how to put a budget together, but it has to be lawful. That may be true, but that's not the purpose of this meeting. And 
getting back to my illustration, you do not trust the person who is managing the office frugally, then you get somebody who does, and it's not us. No, I'm not saying that. It's not, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of bringing experience from different places to share with the general manager. Ideas that he might not have thought about. Okay? That's what it's all about. But this is not the venue for that. Well, I don't know what venue we would use. The workshop that we had two weeks ago. Yeah, with yeah, the well, this, well that's that's that, that, that's, this wasn't about the workshop. That's where I think it's supposed to be is the workshop put out. No. This is for you to approve the budget. Well, that was a misunderstanding. No, during the workshop, it was stated, don't worry about the details of the budget. This is what you were presenting. Mm -hmm. Okay. The details that build this budget is what Mr. McKay is referring to and everyone else. We've got to know what's in the package to say it's good or it's not. Me personally, I can't see saying yes approving a budget that puts us in more of a deficit. Federal government can allow a deficit. When you get into a smaller organization, you spend what you have. You don't keep going on. I agree. And we have an operating budget, not an overall budget deficit. This, this budget's balanced. According to your last, your last page, or a seven hundred and eight thousand dollar deficit operating. The overall budget is balanced. That's why we go through the adjustments and the transfers and the use of reserves. The bottom line is zero. To follow up on the first question, how much percentage do we pay into the first program for us employees? It depends on the employee based on when they came into the program. But for this fiscal year we'll be paying about nine percent. The employee pays eight percent. Pepper employees we each pay 6.25 percent. What pays their pay? That's the percentage of their pay that they pay. That is 100 percent of what they pay. Okay, so they put in 6 percent. So it's always 50 50 that pay. For the Pepper employees, for pre Pepper employees, it's a different allocation depending on the year of the cost. Okay. And then, if you mentioned it when we paid off the, the loan, it was $125,000 payment. Was that our monthly payment? Well, it's a biannual debt service payment. So, you mean on the mortgage of this building? Yeah. Yeah, it was 116000 semi annually. So, it was $230,000, $232,000 that we're not going to be paying out this year. Okay. <coughs> Mr. McCain mentioned it some time back, but we'd like to see the budget cut 25% because we're people using less water, we're not going to have much money coming. Glad you've asked that question, Director Wallace. I've done a comprehensive analysis, um, an analytical, uh, iterative model using Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Access to determine what a 28% decrease in usage would do to our revenue stream. And the outcome is that it will change our revenue stream by 2.8%. And here's why. If you have a tier four customer who's using X number of units, for them to fall into tier three, they would have to stop using 50% of what they're using. However, if you have a lower end tier four user who drops down into the tier three, the difference isn't going to be a 28% stoppage of their usage in terms of revenue because we're still getting the units at tier three. We're still getting revenue basis on the tier three usage and the tier two usage and the tier one usage. And so the only change in that determination, I went back three years. I gathered historical data from three years of billings and went through and analyzed what it would do in terms of a tier, in terms of how much they were paying based on rate structure at that time, and reduced all of that by 28%. I then multiplied that all through and extrapolated the model to show what that would do to our revenue streams. Having said that, I reduced our expected water rates by five. I doubled what I came up with to be conservative. You said the percentage is what? It's going to drop? 
about two and a half. Two and a half percent? Here's a question for you. That's about a different point. You have communicated you decreased our water revenues by five percent. The usage. Usage. The base, the base fees are going to stay the same. What would happen if we lower rates by five percent and increase the usage? Well, you have a bigger operating deficit, and you'd be in violation of the state mandate. That's what we're going to do. Well, we'd be in violation of the state mandate. We have more customers, certainly. But if, if, you, if you expanded your customer base in terms of usage, then yes, maybe. But I don't see that. That's not happening. And, most of the, most and, I, can't, and I can't presume an assumption of, of, of assumed growth into a preliminary budget document. Of course, the harder question is if tier, tier water rates are not you have to, make, to sustain them for either legal reasons or other reasons. Uh, did you factor that into if we had to go down to a, a flat rate or a flat rate? Why would I? I? I'm not working in that environment. Okay. Well, yeah, we are. We're, we're doing no, we're not. Right now, we're working on a tier rate, and until I get there direction, legal direction, not to, I have to base the, the numbers on, on the environment in, in which I'm working. Well, I know so we had 30. 38% usage and 50% in the service fees. What was the total number there? On the water. Can we do one for the chart indicates that we have quite a few, quite a bit of uh, water that we're using. Yeah, 38% was the total number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The use is, is are, are what they use at the tier levels. That is a tier rate, so I guess I'm not. Okay. Is this my understanding? Uh, under personal expenses, there's health insurance, workers' comp, other benefits, first contribution, and we have totals there. Do you want, do you want the breakdown of all those so we can see how they came up with that total? You want to see that before you approve this budget? Is that what we're looking for? In this case, what you're just talking about, we have to break down right there in front of us. The total. We have it also by what uh, enterprise fund it's coming from or whatever. Yeah, so what I'm saying, if, 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 no, those no. if you want to adjust those numbers, you're going to have to go into that and find out how they came up with those numbers. Is that what you want us to do? No. But um, you know, that's just one aspect here. Okay, let me give you an example. Well, any aspect. Okay, here's the example I'm going to give you. We're paying $65 a month for a router, which equals $780. Now, these are just, you know, small little bits of amounts. You know, probably pocket change for you. But say we went out and we bought a router for $200, and that's kind of high. What's going to happen is we would have saved $580 a year. Just I, little things. You know? I understand Benjamin that. Benjamin Franklin but said that is a long time ago, that is no, it's our responsibility to I talk with management. I do not agree with that. Well, that's I your know. opinion. And you need to, to listen to the workshops we've gone to about management and policy. Most of them workshops. And bring that up and ask them what they think. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you this. Most of the workshops that I have been to, is screw the customer as much as you can. And that's the, the idea you, that you I have get a very from. negative view. No, I don't have a very don't negative Don't go to another workshop then. These do not relate to what we're doing with the agenda, what we're supposed to be doing with the agenda. And I think you made it clear, but we had a, our two hour meeting with you separately, you know, Mr. McKay and I. Uh, I had a question how all that, the numbers. They look weird to me, and it's still, the depreciation is still confused to me. It said $1.4 million in depreciation from the water fund. And that's not cash out of our pocket. And we are putting so much into uh, building up a reserve. And am I wrong? I think we came to the conclusion, at least I came to the understanding, that we're actually putting about 8% of our total fee, total fees into building up the reserve. And you know, about that the, the way you did your math is correct. Okay. And, and what that is for the general public's benefit is Director Landscar was interested in the total percentage of the reserve that the district is putting away. 
His question uh, that he emailed into the board workshop, he was unable to meet us due to a work obligation, uh, was why do we need more than 10% reserve? And that question was based on the 25% amount of depreciation that we're putting in for capital improvements. The 8% figure that he's coming up with is the amount of money that we're putting in the reserve based on the total revenues of that particular fund. And when we do the math that way, we are putting 8% of our revenues, total revenues, into a reserve, which falls under the threshold that he was inquiring about. Okay. And I noticed that the street lighting, 30% administrative is still going on for street lighting. Is that something we give to Southern California Edison? Is that something we're paying back on the engineers? Where are you looking for the uh, street lighting? The, uh, if you look at the pie chart. Can you bring that slide up, is that please? some of our armored car service fees to that fund as well because they come and pick up the money that's being delivered to the bank securely for that fund. So if you'd like the detail of what's in the GNA, it's comprised of probably 60 or 70 line items. And they're and it's, it's sharing that with water and sewer is what you're saying? Yeah, so there's a total, let's say that there's a total cost of our armored car of $1,000 a year. We're saying that $100 of it is going to, and these are just hypothetical numbers. Let's say we're paying $1,000 a year for armored car service, we're putting $100 to the street lighting fund, and we're putting the other $450 into both the water and sewer funds, because those are the three funds for which we collect money that needs to be delivered to the bank securely. So we're allocating a portion of the cost of doing that piece of business as a general administrative cost, because it's not a cost of operations. It's not an electricity cost that goes above the line in the operations costs, right? It's the electricity is not a direct operating cost in this example to run the street lights. But having an armored car come and pick up the money to take it to the bank is not. So we put it as a general administrative cost. Okay, but the lighting fund has to absorb a portion of that because it's incurring costs. So the, the operating parts of the building is, is that right, that 67% of the building? Yes. And then general administrative, 30%. And, uh, person's, and the average person's water bill, they get a dollar, they get $21 for their, their uh, water, they get 39 for their sewer. Is it, is it allocated that way, or is, how, is it, uh, how is it breaking out? It, it, it's broken so, out over historical actual trends. Okay, so I mean, is it based on the amount of money they all bring in together? Water and sewer, seven million. For the most part. Street lighting's at 48. To go, to go through every single line item and determine an attributable cost is cost prohibitive. Okay. It's administratively prohibitive. So what we do is we build a general model for types of services. And we say postage, armored car, the things that kind of have the same broad usage, we have a percentage allocation for those types of services as it relates to the amount that should be allocated to each function. Okay, and then the next slide, I have a question about the parts. Also dealing with, uh, with the uh, depreciation, 29%. Uh, yeah, I don't think that depreciation that well, but what are we depreciating in parks? What do we say, the West Park itself, do we own that? The, the, the assets that are in it. So the West Park, uh, the two over park. Water lines. Water lines, sewer lines out there as well. 
all of it, the water lines, the sewer lines, the, the equipment, the tennis courts. Okay. And we'll continue to hold the assets on the books, but at that time we will also relieve ourselves of the assets. Now, is there, the parks are a little bit diff more difficult to understand. Is there, a, are we building up a reserve in the parks as well? No. CSAs are different than the parks themselves because that's the way we maintain them in the county funds, right? 635 is inclusive of the park. And it has the, uh, the park itself plus the pool. But it's broken out here separately in, in our budget, though, right? That was just for your benefit. Okay, it's in, 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 in prior it's years, it's been lumped together as CSA money, but because it's been a topic of conversation lately, I just broke it out for your benefit. So there's you a part one is actually the overall one, and CSA is just a part of the subset. Right? Uh, we gladly take the round and cheer. Because we get a tiny piece of that. Also. Yeah, we hope so, yeah. SCADA, uh, in the game that we don't have to have a person out of the wastewater treatment plant. Do we, is that going to create a problem with security, or are we going to have a security person out there? Uh, it's not for the, the wastewater treatment plant. It's for the water. It's for water. the water at the booster station. Oh, okay. And yeah, we have we have a video up there to keep an eye on that as well, right? No, we do not. A video to take care of the tank site. Yeah. Have they been looking at the cost of maybe adding that? In other words, yeah. In 15 years, we've only had one incident at the tanks. Okay, just an idea. It's more of a price to come down. It's a high, it's a high cost, um, and it doesn't prevent crime. It just allows you to capture sure something. You can do it. <laughs> well, I guess it's sometimes. Right. Yeah, but the cost to come down substantially by the whole system. Unfortunately, when you buy those guys, you know, when you turn it on to see somebody's face, you can't make, you, you can't recognize who they are or, or anything, depending on lighting. Yeah, the lighting. How close they are to the window. I understand the lighting. Pretty nice up here. Is. Um, are we asking the park? So that's all the questions I have. Thank you. I start looking over what you have under general administration. Where do you put your communication? Normally, typically, typically it's rolled up into that under our utilities. So the next hierarchy, you know, the, the top level would be okay, you general would administrative, be then utilities, and then we have our telephone, internet, all of those things. But to give you that kind of detail is... No, no normally what I've seen <coughs> on previous budgets, the military and different places, they'll have a communications line right, right in the budget. And then list it out. They don't break it down. You would just have a general list. Right. And the final budget will have that level of detail. This one does not. We're going to have more workshops on this budget. Is that correct? Not on this budget, but on the final budget, yes. If we do on the final budget, we'll have some workshops. That's what I heard. Indeed. Yeah, that's what I'm. So we'll be able to make suggestions at that time. Absolutely. And we welcome them. Then we can address the organizational structure chart. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, the preliminary budget is simply the three-page document you have in front of you that has to be in place for us to continue operations. But we all know that the legislative environment, the economic environment, the political environment, they're all going to change between now and the time that we adopt the final budget. Um, we may have a different organizational structure, to your point. Uh, we need to address all of those things through conversation. We'll write up a document much like the one that we got last year that addresses all of those items and much to Director Schengeldecker's question, will have a higher level of detail uh, as it relates to what makes up each one of these costs. That's what the final budget's really for. There's not enough time. The, way, the, the reason that this is set up the way it is is because much like the federal government, we hear all these conversations about the debt ceiling. Have to, we have to approve it for the debt ceiling or we can't continue operations. And last year they closed down the parks and they were threatening not to pay debt service to China. 
right? Same thing applies to local government. This document has to be in place by June, July 1st in order for us to continue operations. However, we don't have enough information, nor have we closed our books as of 6.30 of the fiscal year in order to prepare a comprehensive final. at our last workshop. Steve even mentioned John came prepared to answer any question about his area, his budget operator in. And two or three times he says, does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question? And nobody asked John a single question at that meeting. And Steve said, now John's come prepared to answer your questions. Do you have any questions? So I'm saying, if you've got questions, get them to us before the meeting, so they can be answered. I, I don't think I was there. Do you have any answers for us, John, that the, have these questions? I don't, I don't have all my documentation in front of me, but I was prepared to answer any question about any money that was spent in the public works, uh, any of the utility bills, all of it. Anything in, in the departments that I signed for, I can answer for. Was there anything in particular we should be aware of that we might uh, raise a red flag or should have raised a red flag if we missed? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. One of the things I might point out, because of the level of detail, it appears that the board uh, wants, and rightly so, there's some detail in there that if you don't know, you might want to know. And what I might point out in our 
endeavor to take our budget to that next level, to get the recognition, to be uh, uh, fiscally prudent, if you will, uh, in everything that we do. We went to, to a level of putting the budget together that never happened before. And I doubt that many agencies go to that level because we went clear into the weeds on every single item. We reworked it, we uh, uh, consolidated some areas, we adjusted other areas, and we came up with a tighter document. So we know every level of what, what we're spending. The documents that Brad is speaking of, the 70 pages, actually goes into the weeds uh, and he can produce those documents for the board in any one of the uh, uh, fund levels or the GL levels or below that and provide that. It might be beneficial next year that the board uh, also take time to sit in to listen to the management discussion. Uh, not so much from the board members being able to you know, adjust everything, but more for an understanding of what we go through in putting this budget together. I think it's a, a, a very conservative tight budget that we have put together. It is not your final budget, that is true. And we can make those adjustments and just have those discussions that you wish to have in for the workshop. But uh, rightly so, as, as Director Glennon mentioned, the more information and questions that we have prior to workshops and with enough lead time, we can prepare those answers and focus on the areas that you uh, have uh, uh, questions on. And it makes the meetings go a lot quicker. It focuses on those that you desire information on. And uh, it becomes a better uh, time well spent. So, as we move through this, uh, when we move to that uh, next level beyond this, uh, certainly put those questions together so we can uh, provide the information uh, that you want. Yeah, my sister's budget document was about 70 pages long. Thereabouts. And you probably, you and Mr. McKay, can get together and figure out if you're going to do three workshops where you want to start and stop each one and make your own. No. I, I would recommend that we focus more on the numbers and the operations in those workshops versus the budget document itself because the budget document itself, the majority of those pages are simply support for this three-page document. It breaks out all of what's in administrative, you know, general administrative, right, it breaks out the depreciation, it breaks out the operation, it breaks out debt service so you can see the detail. It rolls it up from the detail level and into a very high level. The other pages of it are the drivers. You know, you're looking at population. Why, why is it that we've grown from here to here and it stopped at certain level? That's going to drive how much property tax we get. But that's for the benefit of the reader, not the benefit of the board. So to go through a 70-page document is really kind of, well, it's, it's not needed. You're not going to write the legislative out. You're not going to have any participation in what we're doing from, from a GASB's perspective. You, you have no background or, or need to participate in those types of things. It's, it's really this three-page document that you're approving anyway. You probably call that three-page document shows up in the first ten pages. So you get, you get the front, you get the back, and you get basically the middle. But you can, is, there's a way you can... I would, I would recommend that those three workshops mirror the managerial workshops that we have. We go through the cost centers, we go through the general ledger cuttings, and we go through the funds. That's what I would recommend. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. The other way of doing it.
on your budget, all these income things, you have the new construction. And it and it's come up in the past in past years. Well, new construction dropped off, so our budget was messed up. In my mind, the only part of that budget for that year is a very small percent for inspection and to turn the water on. The rest of that money that people pay to hook up should be going into that depreciation money because it's for uh, infrastructure money that has been already paid for so those people are able to hook up to. In a roundabout way, you're right, and it is happening that way, but it takes several steps to get us that way. When somebody comes okay. in and pays a connection fee, we get X number of dollars for that connection fee. It goes in as a revenue for connection fees. But as part of putting that connection in, we install a meter that gets depreciated, right, a pipe that gets depreciated, and there's right. a piece of that that they're paying for that we then reallocate and cost out the amount that it cost us to put that pipe in the ground or that meter in the ground. On here, this looks like it goes into the general fund for that year, and I'm thinking that money needs to be set aside because that's where it went to. But well, and, and, and in a way, you're goes, right. Yeah. A portion of that money goes clear into the weeds to the state work and everything else. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, there's there's part of it is John going out and inspecting to make sure they hook things up right. Actually, do the turn on the the, the meter. All that stuff's in that eight thousand or whatever it is. Say it's ten thousand dollar hookup. Two thousand of it is that part of it. The rest of it should, is infrastructure. I don't know how they figure that. Not what that number it is, but. Is okay. there any other public discussion? The hearing none. will entertain a motion to pass the preliminary budget. So moved. Mr. Glenn moves. Do we have a second? This would be the time then that we would go for public discussion, but we've already had that. So I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the preliminary budget proposal? Roll call. Yeah, roll call vote. No, it's not a resolution. Okay, you know, there. Mr. Quaista said we should do the roll call vote. It's not going to hurt you to do one, but you're not required to. Yeah.